And what I'm going to be talking about is uh, pediatric gender medicine, um, the medicalization of gender nonconformity, uh, as, as Colin, I think, rightly put it, and um, which I think is uh, easily one of the biggest medical scandals of the 21st century, um, perhaps dwarfed only by the uh, uh, opioid epidemic, although because we're dealing here with kids, it's um, in some ways even more cruel. Uh, so just start with laying out some, some figures, some statistics that we understand what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> uh, just on the rise of transgender identification and diagnoses of gender dysphoria uh, in, among youth. And uh, judging by the numbers of the DSM-5, the Diagnostic uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, which was revised in 2013, and the numbers listed in the DSM-5, which are based on data compiled in the decades before 2013, suggest that uh, you know, a, a fraction of males um, and a fraction, an even smaller fraction of females have this condition. And actually, if we're talking about children, um, the numbers would be even lower than these you know, 0 .000 because uh, this deals with adults. Um, today, Generation Z, kids born after 1997, they're not all kids by now, 2.1%, according to the most recent poll by Gallup. And so that means a rise of between 15,000 and 105,000 percent in the course of a few decades. Um, and uh, we also know, as again Colin showed, that it's, it's becoming by far more common in girls than in boys, especially when it's accompanied um, uh, with uh, distress, clinically significant distress that requires referral uh, uh, to, to a clinic. Now, let me just mention one thing. Um, precisely because trans nowadays is defined as nonconformity to stereotypes, you know, most of you or all of you are parents, you know, what is the one thing that teenagers don't want to be? <laughs> Conformists, right? So uh, when, when people tell me, uh, you know, oh, aren't you surprised that 2% or, you know, in, um, one study showed that in uh, a school district in Pittsburgh in 2018, 9.2% of the students in that district identify as transgender. Um, I recently spoke to a teacher from a very progressive school district in the country, who is himself, by the way, very progressive, um, who said that uh, roughly 25% of every single class that he's had identify as transgender. Um, so when people say to me, you know, aren't you surprised that so many kids, my response is I'm surprised that it's not 100% of kids, um, given how it's being defined. And the fact that, you know, it's, it's considered authentic and courageous to declare yourself transgender, it really is surprising to me that there are some students who resist this stuff. Um, so I think, I, I think, to me, that's a silver lining. Um, that there is a kind of a, a resistance, um, antibodies among the younger generation um, to, the, to these trends. Gender dysphoria. Okay, this is a, we're here already getting into the kind of the medical, the pathological aspect of, of, of trans ID. Um, the DSM-5 uh, uh, replaced the previous designation of gender identity disorder with gender dysphoria, which takes away the word uh, disorder. It's supposed to be less stigmatizing. Um, and the two basic criteria for gender dysphoria are, number one, behavioral conformity to cross-sex stereotypes. And yes, the DSM uses the word stereotypes. And number two, it has to be accompanied by some kind of clinically significant distress or social impairment. Um, and here I, I, I've uh, included some uh, data from Komodo Health that recently compiled data from the United States. Um, showing the rise of gender dysphoria diagnoses uh, among youth over the last uh, five years, since uh, 2017. And as you can see, uh, it, it's about a 20% annual, annual rise. Um, and then in 2020 to 2021, it rose by about 80%. Any ideas why? What happened? Pandemic, Pandemic right? Um, and so now we have 121,882 diagnosed cases of gender dysphoria among youth. And keep in mind, this is very likely a dramatic understatement of the true numbers because it's based purely on insurance claims. Um, and, and a lot of this area of healthcare is done out of pocket. Okay, so we're all aware that there's this debate raging today about gender affirming care. Um, Florida hel uh, held its Medicaid hearing this morning. Um, what is gender affirming care? Let me just kind of lay it out very, very briefly. Um, it basically involves four steps. Social transition, 
which is the adoption of new names, pronouns, um, the use of restrooms and sports teams that are appropriate for the sex you believe yourself to be, um, the issuing of new identification cards. Um, then you have puberty blockers, usually the next step. And as their name suggests, they block the natural process of puberty, um, which, by the way, is the single most dramatic event that the human body will go through throughout the course of its existence, uh, puberty. Um, Cross-sex hormones follow uh, from puberty blockers. Um, so if you want to masculinize yourself, you take testosterone. If you want to feminize yourself, you take estrogen. Um, and then surgeries, um, euphemistically known as top surgeries if we're de dealing with double mastectomies, um, euphemistically known as bottom surgeries if we're dealing with vaginoplasty or phalloplasty, um, if we're dealing with, with um, that area of the body. Um, and uh, yes, all of these things happen with minors in the United States, including surgeries. We have hard evidence of it, no matter the gaslighting that we tend to hear very often in the media. So just kind of the basic assumptions of gender affirming care. What does it mean to affirm? It means to agree with, okay? That's another euphemism. To affirm means to agree with. So when we are affirming a child's gender identity, we're agreeing with that child that he or she really is the sex that they claim to be. Um, and the gender affirming model of care is supposed to replace the developmental model that we held kind of intuitively, but also scientifically and therapeutically until a few years ago, which basically said your identity of who you are is a result of the process of going through childhood and teen, your teenage years and puberty, right? You come out of that process with your identity. You don't go in it with your identity. Um, gender affirming care says, no, no, every human has this innate quality called a gender identity, right? They don't want to call it a soul because that has religious connotations, but it's almost what it is. Um, and that that gender identity is fixed from a very young age. I think most people who support gender affirming care believe in one way or another that some people are just born that way. Um, and the fact that you know, we've seen a rise of 100,000% in the number of people who are trans doesn't seem to phase anyone. It's just taken for granted that some people are just born trans. Um, it's knowable even to young kids through a kind of intuition or feeling. Um, this often goes by the, another euphemism of lived experience. Um, and then you have kind of these famous gender docs, gender doctors, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, pediatricians, endocrinologists, psychiatrists, um, people like Diane Ehrensoft, um, University of San Francisco, California, who says that children as young as two can, quote, tell us who they are and teach us about gender, and adults should follow the child's lead. Um, and what all this means in practice is that there is such a thing as a transgender child. Right? That, that, uh, that this is a real category of human existence. Um, and this is endorsed across the board by pretty much all elite institutions and all elite leaders left of center in the United States. And that includes a medical, the medical associations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association. Um, it means uh, major civil rights organizations like the ACLU and the Human Rights Campaign. And of course, it means the Democratic Party, um, including uh, President Biden and the uh, Secretary, uh, Assistant Secretary for Health, Rachel Levin. Um, and the common mantra that we're used to hearing in the news over and over and over again is that it's medically necessary and life-saving. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my time. So let me just first start by saying, um, anytime I give a talk like this, people always ask me, well, you're going against the advice of the American Academy of Pediatrics and other major medical organizations. Um, what are you, a conspiracy theorist? Like, what do you know that they don't? My first answer to that is, the more important story here is that the United States has now become an outlier in this area of medicine. Um, countries that are much more progressive than we are on LGBT issues, that have had gender-affirming care for about a decade in their medical establishment, have already started dramatically to peel back on it. So since 2019, Sweden, Finland, and the UK have all done what's known as a systematic review of the evidence for gender-affirming care, meaning for the benefits of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones in order to treat a mental health condition. And all three countries have come to the same unanimous conclusion. There is no good evidence that the benefits of these interventions outweigh the risks. Um, and not coincidentally, all three countries have dramatically scaled back their operations when it comes to medically transitioning kids. Um, 
uh, they all now recommend psychotherapy as the first and ideally the only line of treatment that these kids should get, um, leaving complicated, risky decisions about medical transition uh, uh, to adulthood. Um, and the UK just last week, uh, well, a few months ago, it ordered the closure of its main pediatric gender clinic at the Tavistock. Um, uh, the uh, pediatrician leading the investigation into the Tavistock said that there was an appalling lack of, quote, safeguarding there. And she explicitly cited, quote, the affirmative model that, quote, originated in the United States as a major cause of this. Now, if that doesn't send a chill down your spine, I don't know what should. All right, this is the uh, British counterpart to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and France has, uh, the medical, central medical establishment in France has issued great caution, advised great caution when dealing with hormones in kids. Okay, so why have the American medical organizations come to a different conclusion? Um, and so uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Endocrine Society are really the only two organizations that have issued um, any kind of statement in support of gender-affirming care based on cited research. Other organizations have come out in favor of the protocol, um, but they usually cite these two organizations or they don't cite anyone. Um, so you can kind of look at these two organizations as the, the, the leaders in the field of, of pushing um, gender-affirming care. So let's look at what, what evidence they cite. The American Academy of Pediatrics bases its entire understanding of this area of medicine on a single non-peer-reviewed article written by a young doctor fresh out of his residency in 2018. Um, a subsequent fact check by another researcher that was peer-reviewed um, found that this article completely misrepresents pretty much every single source that it cites, and it omits all the relevant research that undermines its conclusion. Right? So this is the kind of study that a systematic review of evidence of the kind that Sweden and Finland did would immediately find to be just complete nonsense. Um, but this is the sole authority for the AAP's uh, recommendation, and therefore also for the Democratic Party's support for this protocol, for the um, uh, left of center media, the New York Times constantly cite the AAP, right? So this is the, the kind of the, the tip of the inverted triangle. Um, endocrine society. Um, the endocrine society, uh, you know, they, they are uh, basically technicians. They don't say whether a kid should be transitioned. They just say, if you decide to transition a kid, here's how you do it, and here's the quality of the evidence uh, for, for the benefits of these interventions. And the Endocrine Society in 2017 published guidelines and used a, an internationally recognized grading system for ra uh, ranking the quality of evidence behind its own guidelines. And according to the Endocrine Society, the quality is either low or very low. All of the evidence cited is either of low or very low quality. Um, and it also rated its own recommendations as, quote, weak. Um, no American medical organization has ever done a systematic review of evidence on this issue. Okay? So anytime somebody says to you, all major American medical organizations support gender-affirming care, this is the only slide that you need to know. I have a whole memo about this published with the Manhattan Institute. It goes into greater depth on these issues. You're welcome to take a look. There's nothing there. Puberty blockers. Um, the risks of puberty blockers are largely unknown, um, but especially the long-term risks, but given the role of hormones in uh, pubertal development and data from studies on precocious puberty, um, we know that it, it's, it tends to be associated with cognitive impairment, so lower IQ, osteoporosis in your 20s is a common side effect for kids who took this for a different condition, precocious puberty. Um, sterility, especially if it's followed up by cross-sex hormones, but because by definition, if your um, uh, sexual organs are not given the chance to develop, you can't produce gametes that then go into reproduction. Um, and it has a lot of psychological uh, risks and side effects, including anxiety and depression, which, by the way, are themselves risk factors for suicide. Um, I should mention that these same drugs, puberty blockers, are used to castrate sex offenders, and that constitutional and civil rights lawyers have argued before in the courts that they should be banned because uh, their side effects constitute cruel and unusual punishment. Um, 
A common claim made on behalf of puberty blockers is that they are fully reversible and merely give a, a, a child a window of time in order to explore his or her identity. Well, there have been three studies published in the last four years uh, that found that 96 to 98% of kids who go on puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. Now, this means one of two things. Either doctors and mental health experts are remarkably efficient at picking out the trans kids from the kids who merely look like they're gender nonconforming, or a much more plausible explanation, and one recognized by a high court in the UK, is that puberty blockers themselves become a cause for kids to want to go on to cross-sex hormones. It's a much more plausible explanation. Um, so one analogy that I like to use is, let's say you take a bunch of toddlers who are playing with building blocks, and you say, all right, let's channel them into, uh, into vocational training to become construction workers, and let's tell them that they're being authentic and non-conforming. 98% um, of them end up becoming construction workers, and we say to ourselves, wow, we have a remarkable ability to pick out adult professional uh, uh, vocational preferences already in toddlerhood, right? Um, so you can tell that I don't buy the argument. Um, there have been no randomized control trials on puberty blockers for this purpose, none. Uh, they, they, they remain FDA unapproved. Um, this is literally experimental medicine and Finland has recognized it as such. Cross-sex hormones and surgeries. Um, very quickly, cross-sex hormones um, have a whole host of risks. You are literally flooding a person's body with synthetic hormones. Um, and these risks include permanent sterility, heightened risk of cancer, heart disease, anxiety, depression, and the list goes on and on. Um, uh, usually it comes with what's known as a medical leash, meaning once you go through this process, you have to continue taking hormones for the rest of your life. Um, surgeries are irreversible. Um, and they have a high rate of complications, 25 to 75%, depending on the type of surgery. They can be extremely dangerous, even to the point of being fatal. Um, claims about the mental health benefits, and this is, of course, where the rubber meets the road, right? This is what all the debate is about, that we need these interventions because these kids are suffering acutely and they're going to kill themselves. I'll get to the suicide point at the end of it, but they're going to kill themselves if they don't get them. Um, it, you know, it turns out that when you actually look at the body of research in support of this protocol, um, the studies are either extremely weak methodologically, um, or they actually don't show what activists claim that they show. So they tend to have an extremely low follow-up time. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, papers published in the last couple of years claiming to show the benefits of top surgery, um, double mastectomies, had a three-month follow-up time. Three months. How about asking these girls when they're in their mid-30s and now they can't have kids and can't breastfeed um, what they feel about their chest surgery? Um, you know, asking a 16-year-old three months after she had the operation what she feels about it, it doesn't tell you anything about whether it's necessary for long-term mental health. Um, they have narrowly defined outcome measures, relieving chest dysphoria. <laughs> really? I mean, how about like broader cognitive functioning, broader uh, well-being, quality of life? Um, and they have extremely high rates of dropout. Um, so it really uh, makes it hard to, to, to have adequate controls for these studies. Um, and there are no long-term follow-up data, no long-term follow-up studies on puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, or surgeries for minors. None. Zero. So let me talk a little bit about social transition because this is where the question of schools starts to become relevant. Social transition, as I said, use of new names, pronouns, um, restrooms of your choice, whatever, right? Um, number one, there's no scientific evidence that humans have an innate and immutable quality known as a gender identity. Um, even the Dutch researchers who developed this protocol said that um, claims about brain sex and all these things, they rely on what they call on psychological methods, meaning if a person really insists that they are that sex, that's the only thing we can know. We infer that they may have something in their brain based on their insistence, but we have no evidence of it. Um, there have been 12 studies on rates of persistence and desistence over the years. 11 of these studies, but persistence means that the dysphoria, that distress over your body persists, and desistence means that it stops, right? 11 of these studies show that 61 to 98% of kids um, who have cross-gender behavior, distress, and all those kinds of symptoms desist by puberty. That puberty itself clarifies to them 
um, that no, these feelings that you had are not because you were assigned the wrong sex at birth. Um, it's probably some other issue. And in fact, in most of these studies, it turns out that most of these kids come out as gay or lesbian. Um, one study, the most recent one, um, showed 97.5% persisted in their cross-gender identification. Why the discrepancy? How do you reconcile the, uh, the one study with the 11? Well, it turns out that in that last study, the 12th study, all the kids were socially transitioned. Who would have thunk? If you take a bunch of kids, you socially transition them, all the adults in their life continue to confirm to them, yes, yes, you really are the sex that you claim to be, the vast majority and almost all of them will continue to believe it five years later. That's all the study found. And of course, this study was uh, hailed in the New York Times as yet more evidence that clinicians are remarkably efficient at picking out the true trans kids. And so social transition is something that in the medical literature is known as an iatrogenic intervention, meaning a form of illness that is caused by the treatment itself. Um, this, thankfully, was recently recognized by the UK. Um, thank you, Joanne, for uh, coming from a country that has a little bit of sanity on this issue. Um, the UK, as of last week, advises caution on social transition. The Cass report by Dr. Hilary Cass um, said uh, social transition is not a neutral act. It constitutes an active psychosocial intervention. And the new NHS draft guidance that dropped last week uh, strongly discourages social transition in children. And for teenagers, it says only for those who have an actual diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and even then, only on the basis of informed consent. Informed consent is only something that you use for a medical intervention. Um, so that means that they now recognize social transition as a form of medical intervention. And yet, the American Academy of Pediatrics still, to this day, recommends automatic social transition for any child who declares themselves to be a sex other than the one uh, that they really are. Uh, and, and according to the 2018 paper, um, AAP says that a failure to automatically affirm a, a kid constitutes conversion therapy and should be banned. And many blue states now actually have banned that. OK, so where does this come in for you, your child, and your school? Um, number one, and this connects to uh, some of the things that James Lindsay was saying, um, disassociation. When teachers teach about gender identity or depict transgenderism in a positive light by calling it nonconformity or being authentic, um, they are planting in the heads of kids, uh, uh, um, impressionable kids, the idea that you really do have this gender identity, that it's just a matter of being authentic and reflecting on who you really think you are. So all these things that kids for the, the vast majority of human history never even, never even occurred to them to ask the question, now it becomes a problem in their minds. Um, and of course, this is accompanied by kind of the casual, spontaneous use of the trans movement's terminology, sex assigned at birth, and so on and so forth, um, asking students actively to reflect on their gender identity and to be allies, and what's known as love bombing, right? Which is when even one kid comes out as trans, all the teachers pounce, oh, you're so courageous and brave, and they clap for them, and uh, all this shower them with positive attention. Um, and what schools are doing, and I've come to learn through talking to a lot of parents, private schools, probably even more than public ones, are socially transitioning kids. They don't call it that. They say, we have an inclusive environment. We are supportive and compassionate. But the, the practical consequence of what they are doing is to socially transition kids without a medical diagnosis, and, and more and more frequently, without parental consent or even notification. And uh, there are lawsuits across the country now that are starting to raise this issue as a violation of parental rights, but we are nowhere near being able to require schools to notify parents when they, when they do this behind their back. So I'm not going to get into the common myths. This is kind of a more of a rebuttal um, uh, a slide. If you want to, we can get it into the Q&A. But you know, all these claims made by activists that if you don't do it, they're going to kill themselves, that puberty blockers are fully reversible, that, uh, that these kids are born that way. Um, that these studies are evident, that the, uh, this protocol is evidence-based, that there's no rates of regret. Um, we can get into that if you want, but these claims are, uh, for anybody who's no, who knows the research or has the time or inclination to get into it, are fairly easily rebutted. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a depressing message to end on, but as I said, this really is, I think, the preeminent medical scandal of the 21st century. Uh, I think we're starting to see the tide turn very, very slowly. 
um, but it's reached epic proportions in our, in our nation's schools, um, and I think it needs to stop. Thank you.